That's true. I want to talk to you today. I felt highly impressed earlier this week to just talk to you about dealing with depression. The highly complex lifestyle of this latter portion of the 20th century and many who have expectations that are either very slowly being realized or not being realized at all has a tendency to put even those persons who are members of the body of Christ and actively involved in the church into a state of depression. When I felt the impression of the Lord to talk to you concerning that subject, the first thing that uh, was vividly brought to my mind was the very fact that the word depression is not even found in the King James Version of the Holy Bible. However, when I consulted the Lord, now people are depressed. They are trying all kinds of remedies to alleviate depression. But if it's not in the Bible, how can I talk about it? And the Lord gave me to know that uh, it's in the Bible. Uh, it's just not under the word depression. <laughs> so I repeat that the word depression is not found in the King James Version of the Holy Bible. However, there are some synonyms, words with similar meaning, along with a number of situations which are depictive of depression to be found in the Holy Scriptures. Well, for example, as an opener, let's just look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 45 and we'll see there a picture of depression even though uh, you will not find the word used. Ushers, God bless you. You may uh, feel free to sit down and get your Bibles also. Very short chapter in the book of Jeremiah. And I certainly want you to just read these five short verses with me, although you'll see what I'm talking about about midway through the chapter. Jeremiah chapter 45, you have it? Come on, let's read it aloud. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch. Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sign, and I find no rest. Thus shalt thou say unto him, The Lord said thus, Behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. And seeketh thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. For behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But thy life will I give unto thee, 
for a prey in all places whither thou goest. Now, what you find here, Baruch, he was really a relative of uh, Jeremiah, probably uh, a cousin. That's not the important thing. What is important is that while Jeremiah was in prison, it was Baruch who became his secretary or his scribe. Now, this young man gave up a lot to become the scribe or the personal secretary of the prophet Jeremiah, who at this time was not popular like he is with us. When you get through reading the writings of Jeremiah, you hear the kind of preaching he did, you can understand he wasn't popular. And for Baruch to take up with him, uh, he risked a whole lot as it relates to reputation and what people felt about him. And like many of us, when we give up our friends and give up our lifestyle to come into holiness, you come in sometimes with a whole lot of high expectations. You've been watching the various ministries on television and you found out how that as a child of God you have a right to great inheritance and you come into holiness looking to stay a few days and then start pushing buttons and money comes your way and property comes your way and respectability and position. You're looking for the blessed side. And strangely enough, the name Baruch means blessed. But this man is kind of disappointed with the things that he see. He knows Jeremiah is a true prophet of God. But he also sees how Jeremiah is being put down. So Jeremiah has to give a word from God to his own uh, scribe or his own personal secretary. He says to him in verse 3, uh, Thou didst say, Woe is me now. You know, you start looking at where you are and you start feeling sorry for yourself. Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sign, and I find no rest. Now, what is he in but a state of depression? Saying the Lord has added grief to his sorrow, he's fainted, he's in a point of sighing, he's sitting around, he's disappointed, he's not uplifted, but he's sinking in despair. And instead of the prophet giving him something that sounds like encouraging words to pull him out, he tells him to the contrary. He said, thus shalt thou say unto him. God says, this is what I want you to tell Baruch. The Lord says thus, behold, that which I have built will I break down. That which I have planted I will pluck up even this whole land, and seekest thou great things for thyself? You sitting around looking to get rich? You sitting around looking for a whole lot of good things to happen to you? In other words, the Lord said, forget it. And a whole lot of times that's what put people in a state of depression because they're sitting around waiting for things that are unrealistic to happen. We live in a real world. Being saved will teach you how to cope with the world, but being saved does not take you out of the world. And some have found yourself in a state of depression because of unrealistic expectation. Now you can put that one on hold, you know, just, just let that one swing in the balance for a while. And we're going further. Turn to Daniel for just a moment. Because here you find that even the prophet Daniel for a minute or two, a few days, he found himself in a state of depression. In chapter 8, at the end of the chapter, verse 27, Daniel says, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Now what is he talking about? You read the earlier verses and God showed Daniel a vision. 
And the vision that God showed him was a vision that others did not understand, but he understood it. And in that vision, it was not a vision of God's people triumphing. Sometimes God's people are defeated. Now we know we're going to win the war in the end. But we're going to lose a lot of battles before we win the war in the end. And Daniel said, when I understood it, when I looked and saw what was happening, he said, I fainted and was sick certain days. All of a sudden, Daniel went into a state of depression. But he didn't stay in it. Now this is, this is when it becomes dangerous. It's when you get in it and stay in it. He said, I fainted and was sick certain days. But read the rest of it. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. Now you ought to touch somebody and tell them, if you're in a state of depression, don't stay there too long. Get up and do the king's business. Now, the word depression, and as I said to you, it is not found in the King James Version of the Holy Bible. Yet there are many synonyms, many words with uh, similar meaning. The word depression is defined in the Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary Number one, this is the little short one. It says, a state of feeling sad. Then it adds the word dejection. Then we come to the second definition, which is a little more uh, lengthy. It's spelled out in more detail. And this is probably the definition that the medical profession would use. It is defined as a psychoneurotic or psychotic disorder marked especially by sadness, inactivity, difficulty in thinking and concentration, a significant increase or decrease in appetite. It simply means some people in a state of depression, they lose their appetite and they don't eat. And others that you're used to seeing the skin and bones, depression with them makes them eat. And you wonder why they start blowing up. And excessive time spent sleeping. I'm still reading this prolonged uh, kind of uh, extended definition. Feeling of dejection and hopelessness and sometimes suicidal tendencies. Now when you think about that word suicide, it, it's a strange thing. The persons that you may find in the Bible who were used of God but entered into a state of depression like those of us who are saved and have the fear of God and don't want to incur the wrath of God even in a state of depression. You wouldn't think too much of suicide. But when Elijah got into a state of depression, he asked God to take his life. <laughs> oh, okay, y'all don't remember that? <laughs> Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. And let's look at that for a moment.
Now here is the man that walks in before Ahab, said, as I live, said God, there shall not be doing the rain falling upon the ground, but according to my word, took that invisible key and locked up heaven. It wouldn't rain. The dew wouldn't fall on the grass for three years and six months. And here's the man that goes down to the brook Kirith and he's there. A raven feeds him in the morning and in the evening, bread and flesh. He drinks water out of the brook until the brook dried up. Then the Lord tells him, arise, go to Zarephath. And he found that widow woman gathering two sticks, getting ready to cook the last she had so that she and her son could eat it and die. And here's a man with the authority of God tells her, you know, fetch me some water. And as she went to get the water, bring me a morsel of bread. She said, I don't have but just a little meal in a barrel, a little oil in a cruise, getting ready to cook the last meal I have. My son and I are going to eat it and die. He said, that's all right. Cook it and bring me the first cake. Boy, would he have got cussed out if he had said that to us. <laughs> But the woman obeyed God and brought it and he takes a bite of that cake and smacks his lip. Oh, by the way, go on back and cook some for yourself and your son. I got the promise of God. The meal won't fail till the day that God sent rain upon the earth. Now, God didn't run the woman's meal barrel over. But every time she got ready to cook, that was enough for her to cook another meal for herself and her son. Now that's a powerful prophet. And finally, when the, when the time for the drought to be over, he calls for a meeting at Mount Carmel. And he says, I want the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the grove, 850 all total. Meet me at Mount Carmel. We'll see who's God. The God that answered by fire, let him be God. And they called on their God Baal all the morning and couldn't get a spark. 850 of them. The Bible said they leaped on the altar according to their custom. Cut themselves with stones, getting up there, you know, beating themselves like we've seen it with chains and stones and making themselves bleed, trying to get Baal's attention. But Baal had eyes that couldn't see and ears that couldn't hear and a throat that could not articulate speech. And they did all of that, couldn't get a spark. And early afternoon, he said, all right, you fellas, it's my time. Tear down your altar. Rebuild the altar of God. And then he looks to heaven after dousing the, the, the sacrifice and the wood and the altar with 12 barrels of water. And just asked God, send down some fire. The fire came down, consumed the sacrifice, burned up the wood, licked up the waters in the trenches. And then he said, all right, now I want you to kill all of these false prophets. And when he got through killing the false prophets, look at chapter 19 of 1 Kings. Read. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by the morrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. Now, can you imagine that? Here's a man just got through calling down fire from heaven and gets a message from one demon-possessed woman. So I'm giving you 24 hours to get out of town. Yes, I'm going to kill you. And he started running. He went for his life, read, and came to Beersheba which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself, now he left his servant, but he kept running. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. 
came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said it is enough now O Lord take away my life <laughs> I'm not better than my fathers they, you know, they, they, they were persecuted they died so now Lord you killed me in other words I'm not going to drink no poison I'm not going to put a knife to my own throat I'm not going to climb up a tree and jump and hang myself but I'm depressed now I want to die, so God, you do it. You do the honors. You kill me. See, it does not mean a person gets into a state of depression simply because nothing has gone their way. This man was a flaming fire. I mean, he was doing a work for God. He was so high on what God was doing through him that he even told the Lord later on in this, you know, they've killed all your prophets now. I'm the only one left. And God had to let him know, I got 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal nor kissed his image. You can just get through doing a great work for God and that demon of depression will still get on your trail. But now notice here what the Lord said to him. Verse 5, as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. See, some of you all that allowed depression to take you over and lost your appetite, and the juniper tree represents the fact that you are in a place of despair, Distress. Hello. I just want to cool out now. I sold all the dinners I'm going to sell. I've ushered all I'm going to usher. I've sung in the choir all I'm going to sing. And you won't find me on the missionary's roll no more. I'm under the juniper tree. I'm going to cool out. Angel says, Stop talking crazy. Get you something to eat, fella. <laughs> Sometimes you can pull yourself out of it. He wasn't able to cook it himself, so the angel cooked it and gave it to him and told him to eat. So now you're going to have to go in the strength of this 40 days. This is the only fast in the Bible that begins with a meal rather than ends with one. Everybody else, they're fasting. You, you, you read about them fasting and then at the end of it eating. But here the angel told him, now you eat. And he let him go back to sleep and told him, eat some more. He said, because you're going to have to go in the strength of this for 40 days. Amen. What you're out of, what you're into, you're not going to come out of it immediately. But God wants you to know that uh, he's got a time set. And you're going to come out of it. And he's going to give you a brand new beginning. But you know, you have to be very careful about how you sit and wish to die. Because even though Elijah did not die, when he got to point give up, when he told the Lord, you know, take my life, in essence, what he said during his state of depression for all practical purposes came to pass. He came to a point where he was tired of being the prophet. He felt like he had done enough. And when he finally ate the food and traveled 40 days until he came to the mountain of God and he waited to hear what God would say and God wasn't in the whirlwind and he wasn't in the storm. He wasn't in any of the noisy things that happened, but when the Lord comes and whispers to him in a still, small voice, the directions that he received was to go back and anoint two separate men to be kings in that area. And then I want you to choose Elisha, and he's going to take your place. 
Since you're asking to die, you're tired of being my prophet, go ahead on, get somebody to take your place. And when he chose Elisha, it was not long <laughs> before they crossed over the river of Jordan and the chariot came down to get Elijah. And Elijah's time here was over and Elisha took up the reins. I'm only trying to say to you that when you are in a state of depression, deep discouragement, deep despair, be mighty careful about what you say. Because you may say some things in your state of depression that when you come back to yourself, you may regret, but you'll still have to pay the penalty. Well, let's just drive that point home a little further by turning back to Numbers chapter 21. I'm trying to give you some scriptural direction on how to deal with it. I know you all would rather me just tell the organist to strike a note and, and then we start shouting and dancing and you try to dance your way out of it. But see, when you get through and go home and stretch out on the bed, it haven't gone nowhere. You, you haven't successfully jumped your way out of it. You got to reason your way out of it. Numbers chapter 21, do you have that? Now in Numbers 21, look at... Um, Verse 4, read. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Now this is the same thing. The word discouragement is another synonym to the word depression. And it says they were much discouraged, which meant they were in a state of deep discouragement because of what happened. They were in a state of depression. Why? Because of the way. I've seen people sit right up in the Pentecostal church, we, you know, the sanctified group, and you get discouraged. Because I didn't know it was like this. When you hear some of the things out of this word that God requires of you. When God denies you the privilege of shacking up without the benefit of marriage. When you find that even if you have those homosexual tendencies that God says that that's uh, abomination. And he wants men to be men and women to be women. And sometimes the mandates of God as it relates to this holy way cause some folk to drop out. They get discouraged. They say, I didn't know it was like that. I thought that I was just going to join that church because I like the way the choir sing. And the preacher come up with a good sermon every now and then. But it's more to it than the singing of the choir and the preaching and teaching of the minister. It's a way. The Lord says a highway shall be there and a way. You ought to touch somebody and tell them holiness is a way of life. And you got to be encouraged to live this way. <laughs> Hello, y'all. It's no good to try to live it discouraged. They were much discouraged about the way. In other words, why in the world we crossed the Red Sea? Why we got to keep on going down the banks of the Red Sea and going a long way around when we could cut across Edom? We don't want to travel this way. But honey, you got to realize God brings you the way that he brings you. 
in order to make you what he wants you to be. Hallelujah. A lot of times when you're driving, uh, you know, going across country and going to certain areas, they may show you the main uh, highways, the interstate, which is the closest route. But then sometimes they'll point and say, travel the scenic route. And the scenic route uh, is a long way around. But there are a whole lot of things that while you're in the area, they want you to see. And sometimes God does not bring us straight from point A to point E. He could, but he takes you from A, B, C, and D, and finally over the E. Because there's some things he wants you to see. It's some experience he wants you to get under your belt. Some things that you don't even understand now, you, you don't have any use for it now, but 20 years from now, it may be the difference between life and death. You ought to tell somebody, don't go into a state of depression because of the way God is leading. Verse 5, and I remember covering this when I preached the message. Oh, I believe that must have been tape 528, entitled Discouraged. Look at verse 5. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Now, why did they do that? Because they were discouraged. That's why I tell you, be careful what you say when you're in a state of depression. You may say some things that you will live to regret. They were discouraged, got into a state of depression, discouraged because of the way they spoke against God and against Moses. And what were they saying? Wherefore? Have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, neither is there any water. And our souls loathe this light bread. Yeah. Now when God first started raining it down, they were, saw it falling from heaven. Yeah. And they ran out there looking at those little round wafers like a coriander seed. And they said, oh, manna, manna. Manna simply means, wh what is it? Man, what? They never did know what to call it. We said they ate manna, but technically speaking, they ate man what? For 40 years. That's what they said when they saw it. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what to call it. So the word manna meant man what? <laughs> they ate man what? For 40 years. They said this is angel food. But when they got into a state of depression, Moses, you should have left us in Egypt. We were acquainted with the leeks and with the onion and with the garlic. We knew what we were eating down there in Egypt. Brought us out here in the wilderness and we eating this light bread. I'm sick of this stuff. God had prepared it in the ovens of heaven and rained it down every morning and they had the nerve in their depression to call it light bread. Touch somebody and tell them, while you are depressed, keep your mouth shut. Now the result comes in verse 6, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. God sent in the fiery serpents because of what they said, because they murmured but they murmured because they were in a state of depression. <laughs> Amen, y'all. Let me go back a little bit further here and then we're gonna start back traveling in the direction of the New Testament. But come to Genesis chapter 45. We talk so much about Jacob whose name was changed to Israel. But there was a time in Jacob's life 
when he fell into a state of depression. You remember that out of Jacob's 12 sons, when you go back and read up on the life of Jacob, and certainly when I was a little boy, I thought that those 12 sons were born into a normal family where Jacob had a wife and 12 children were born. But I found out later that those 12 boys were mothered by four different women. Leah, Rachel, the two sisters, and then each one of them had a maid. Zilpah and what's the other one's name? Bilhah and Zilpah. So all of these 12 boys were born to Leah, Zilpah, Bilhah, and Rachel. And you can imagine that if you've got 12 brothers, each of them have the same father, but each of them, you know, they have different mothers, that they're not going to always get along. And then here comes one of the younger ones, and he's a dreamer. And his dreams are such that his brother's sheaves bows down in obeisance to his. The stars bow to him. And they got tired of his dreams and decided one day they had the proper opportunity to kill him. But one of the brothers had more compassion. Well, we won't kill him. Just put him down here in the pit till we decide. And they decided to go ahead on and sell him to some Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites in return carried him down into Egypt. And there in Egypt, he sold to Potiphar. Potiphar becomes his master. But Potiphar's wife, she sees this handsome young fella, and she wants him. But he's too honorable. So he comes out of his coat rather than yield to her. And then she goes on and tells her husband, that he tried to force her, and here's the coat to prove it. So he ends up in jail. In the meantime, word has been taken back to Jacob, the father, that your son Joseph is dead. And he goes through his time of grief. But when there's no corn anywhere in Israel, and they learn that there is food in Egypt. He sends his boys down to Egypt to see if they can get food. In the meantime, Joseph, their brother, the dreamer whom they hated, God has elevated him to be the prime minister. And before you can get any food, you got to go before Joseph. They didn't know who Joseph was. Instead of having on that coat of many colors that they took back to their daddy, blood soaked, to prove he was dead. Instead of having on just the common uh, robings of a Hebrew, here he's all dressed up in the majestic garments of an Egyptian prince. And they bow before him. <laughs> And not knowing who he is. And when he reveals himself, they go back and tell their father, Jacob, that your son, Joseph, is alive. And can you imagine when hope has been dashed to pieces, you've gone through a time of grief, and then somebody comes along with such an impossible story, that he a lost, long, long lost son that you thought was dead and buried is alive. It was too much for him. And when, he, when they told him that, instead of grief this time, Jacob goes into depression. Look at it, Genesis 
45 and verse 26. What does it say? And told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. Now that's all that happened. He went into a state of depression. But read the next verse. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Words couldn't bring him out of it. What are y'all doing? I, I've already been through this grief one time. You've taken me back through it again. Nothing they could say would bring him out of it until they began to tell him word for word what Joseph had said. And then he looked out and saw the wagons loaded up with food. And he knew when he saw the wagons that there's somebody down there in Egypt that cares a lot about me. Sometimes uh, we can't believe God till we see the wagons. <laughs> oh, the Lord has promised what he's going to do for his children. And all oh, we'll shout and we'll praise God. And we keep on living on faith. But one day, they said the ship comes in. One day, your train load comes in. What is that psalm that says something about he daily loadeth us with benefits? When your wagon load of blessings start coming in, that'll pull you out of it right in a hurry. But the thing about God is you got to learn you can't hurry him. If you're depressed because of what he's promised and it hasn't happened yet, then you got to learn how to wait on him. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Your strength is gone and if you're in a point of depression, hallelujah, just learn how to wait on him. Look at Psalm 27 and 13 coming back and then we're going to jump into the New Testament and we'll be through with this. Psalm 27, look at verse 13, you have it? Come on, read it. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So now I was on my way out. I saw other folk that wasn't living for God getting their new cars and moving into their new house, getting raises and promotions on the job, and it almost got me. I had fainted. Only thing kept me out of depression was because I believed that I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord, not when I cross over on the other side, but I'm going to see it here. But I found out that if I'm going to see it, look at the next verse. What have I got to do? Wait on the Lord and don't get discouraged but be of good courage he'll strengthen thine heart hallelujah glory to God don't push the panic button don't go into depression but learn how to wait on God touch somebody and tell them while you're waiting on him trust his timetable Let him do it in his own time. Oh, glory to God. Well, I'm going to give you two more scriptures and we're finished. Turn over here in the second Corinthians chapter four. Don't think that you're not going to ever have depressing situations. The answer to depression is not to think that you can live free 
of depressing situations. Hello, y'all. Do you have 2 Corinthians? Look at chapter 4. Come down to verse 8. Read it. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Now, now in other words, all he's saying to you, learn what side to be on. Too many of y'all are on the left side of the comma. You got to move over on the right side of the comma. All right, look at it again. On the left side of the comma, we're troubled. On every side. See, that's the left side of the comma. Comma, but come on the right side of it. Yet, not distressed. Now we're back to the left side. We are perplexed, comma, but come on to the right side, not in despair. Persecuted, come on back to the right side, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Took somebody and tell them, learn how to live on the positive side. Then as I close, back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. One of my favorite passages that I started depending on when I was just a youngster. Paul said to the Corinthian church there in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. See, the devil gets you into a state of depression and despair, dejection, by feeling like, oh, have nobody, don't nobody have to go through what I have to go through. Why is life so hard for me? Look like I was picked out to be picked on. Nobody have the, tr nobody know the trouble I see. But it says here that no temptation has taken you but such as is common to man. Whatever you going through, others are going through that and worse. Don't, don't have a pity party talking about, you know, nobody's going through it but me. At your pity party you call in loneliness and all of the other bad guys. I'm going through it by myself. No. Others are going through the same thing. What you're going through is common to man. And then you got to remember the next part of it. But God is faithful. Friends may not be faithful, but God is faithful. Relatives may not be faithful, but God is faithful. Hallelujah. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. You talking about I can't take no more. That's all I can take. You would have been out of it long time ago if you hadn't said that. God was just getting ready to bring you out. But when you told the Lord I can't take no more, the Lord said, oh, I'll leave you in it six more months. I've got to prove to you, you can take some more. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. Hallelujah. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape. Touch somebody and tell them there's no period after the word escape. All you find that is a comma. He'll make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, before he delivers you from it, He's going to first deliver you in it. Ask Daniel about it. Daniel will tell you that my real deliverance didn't come 
when King Darius told him to get me out of the den of lions. But God delivered me in it before he delivered me from it. If God hadn't delivered him in it, he would have been the meal for the lions that night. But before God delivered him out of the den, he delivered him in the den. And I want you to know that whatever you're going through, you don't have to wait until God bring you out of it. He can give you joy while you're in it. He can give you peace while you're in it. That's the reason I tell you, don't sit around depressed. Wait for the battle to be over. Don't wait till the battle is over. You can shout now. When you're depressed, the devil tells you a whole lot of things. He'll tell you that God don't see your tears, that God don't hear you cry, that God is not concerned about you. But Jesus said, let me tell you something. Your heavenly father feeds the little sparrow. And if he feeds the little sparrow, doesn't even have the ability to store and put things in the barns but it's your father that feeds them and he said don't you know you are much better than many sparrows and you got to know who you are no matter what I'm going through I may be like Joseph down in a dungeon but God knows where I am and he has a purpose for my being here no matter where I am or what I'm going through, God knows where I am. And when he gets ready in his own time, he's going to bring me out. Come on, tell somebody, you don't have to be depressed. Whatever you're in, whatever you're going through, God knows who you are. gonna bring you out oh! I got to quit but the psalmist he said I believe they're in Psalm 119 and over there around verse 69 through 71 and 73 he said it's good for me before my affliction I went astray but now have I kept thy word now the, 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 the translation of the Bible by James Moffat the Moffat translation removes the word trouble or rather removes the word afflicted and puts in the word trouble and he said it's good for me to have been in trouble I don't know what kind of trouble you're in but don't let it rock you into a state of depression God only has you there you're just matriculating through God's university and your class is named trouble but you're gonna come out of the class called trouble you may have dropped off into a class called depression but God knows it may be a hard class, but he's got a degree waiting on you. It's a requirement for the course. When you come out and pass the class called depression, he's gonna give you back your joy. He's gonna give you back your smile. He's gonna give you back your peace of mind. He's gonna give you back your power of concentration. He's gonna give you back your dreams and visions. Hang on! Oh, glory. You know, we're in the winter time. Oh, I'm trying to quit. But see, there's a passage over there that tells me weeping may endure for a night. While you're in your depressed situation, you're crying. Folk trying to talk to you, 
and you dabbing and wiping tears crying when have nobody said anything sometimes there are nights winter nights are longer you see back in the summer when we were under the tent the sun wasn't going down until 8 30. now the sun is setting around 4 30. so the winter night comes early and hangs on late look like you've been in it for a long time it may be a winter night but that night is going to be over after a while weeping may endure for a night but touch somebody and tell them hang on till morning joy is coming in the morning victory is coming in the morning deliverance is coming in the morning a new spring in your step is coming in the 